Hey everybody, welcome to our online gathering. Today is the perfect Sunday for you to jump in because today is small group Sunday and community is everything right now. So make sure you go to blueprintchurch.tv slash small groups to choose your group and get signed up today. Then meet your group this week. And if this is your first time joining us online, we'd like to invite you to go to blueprintchurch.tv slash first time and check in. We just want to connect with you and get to know you and even give you a chance to connect with us for any questions that you might have. We are so glad you are watching with us today. But here at Blueprint, we believe that generosity is normal. And not just generosity, but the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Not when we give grudgingly or out of necessity, but we get to be cheerfully generous, which is awesome even in this time of quarantine. I know for me and my wife, it has been such a relief knowing that God is our provider. Not my job, not my income, not anything else, but God is our provider. I even got a bonus last week. That's not supposed to happen during quarantine. So it has just been such a relief and just a joy knowing that our security is found in God being our provider. But if you'd like to, to give today, I want to invite you to go to blueprintchurch.tv slash give, and you can fill out all your information right there, and you can either set up reoccurring giving where it comes out all every time you get a paycheck like me and my wife do, or you can just do a one-time gift. But let's pray, and then we will get into the message. God, I just thank you for everybody uh, that's joining us today. I pray that you would bless the tithes and the offerings that are coming into this house. I pray that you would multiply those back to the people, not just in monetary terms, but God, multiply back to them joy and peace and everything good that comes from you, God. I pray that you would just bless them in Jesus' name. Now, let's get into this message this morning from our lead pastor, Adam Keys. Hey, Blueprint Church, good morning. I feel so blessed and grateful to be joining you today. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. No matter where you're watching from this morning, no matter what situation you find yourself in, this day has been created by the God who loves you, and therefore you have a reason to rejoice. I'm wondering what you're going to be glad in today. What are you going to choose to be glad in today? Just put something right there in the comments that you're thankful for this morning and will choose to rejoice about. For me, I'm thankful God has given me and my wife two kids that are healthy and strong. They are full of life and love. It's not that they don't give us some headaches sometimes because they do, but they are just amazing kids. And I'm so glad I've gotten to spend a lot more time with them over the past few months while we've been kind of in lockdown and in quarantine. What is it for you? What are you going to choose to rejoice about today? I'm interested to look through and see what you guys put. And if this is your first time joining us online, my name is Adam Keys. I'm the lead pastor of Blueprint Church, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. I'm rejoicing that you're with us. Here at Blueprint, you will find very quickly that this is not like family. This is family. Yes, this is a place where people genuinely want to connect with you, get to know you, and help you become a fuller version of who God has created wow. you to be. And you couldn't have joined us on a better Sunday to get your feet wet because today is small group Sunday. That means that today is the kickoff of our summer small groups. Each group lasts eight weeks, is completely online, and by getting involved in one of these, you will be able to not only grow in your relationship with God, but also grow in your relationship with other people. So if this is your first time today, or if you call Blueprint Home, I encourage you with everything in me, get in a group. You need this. Yeah. I need this. We all need this in our lives. Go check out the groups that are posted at blueprintchurch.tv slash small groups, and get in one today. So who's ready for the word this morning? I heard one or two here. I hope you're saying it at home. Who's ready to get into the word of God today? I'm ready to bring the word. Today we are wrapping up our series in the book of Colossians. I have loved this series because we've gone verse by verse through this letter that Paul wrote to a young church in Colossae. And it's been so cool each week how we've gone through this book, how the Lord is speaking through these verses into situations we're dealing with in our daily lives. 
How many of you know that God's Word is timeless? It's just as relevant today as it ever has been. It's just as powerful today as when it was written first. And through uh, times and, and eras changing and situations changing, cultures changing, generations may come and go and ideas shift of what's most important, but the gospel, it remains the same. God remains the same. He is still loving. He is still kind. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He is generous. He's righteous. He's caring. He's strong now and forever in every generation. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In this gospel that we have, the word of God, it never changes. So whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever one you'll find yourself in tomorrow, this word is for you and it's relevant. Now where we're at today, as we're wrapping up Colossians, the Apostle Paul has taken a shift. He's turned this corner in where he was talking primarily about doctrine at the first of Colossians. He's turned this corner into discussing what walking out this faith in Christ looks like. It's getting really practical now. What it looks like to be a Christ follower in our daily lives. And as we focus today on five verses, let's ask God to open our hearts, to speak to us, and to help us find application for His Word in our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you together, one in spirit, as a church family, as everybody joining around the world. Lord, we come to you and we say, in the name of Jesus, move in our hearts. Would you open our eyes? Would you open our hearts to receive your word? And would you not only give us understanding, but give us application. Show us how to apply your word to our lives. Show us how we need to start to line up to who you say we are, to who you say we are to be, how we are to conduct ourselves around other people that you also love. Would you give us application today and make us courageous in applying it to our lives, even where it may feel uncomfortable. Work in us, work on us today. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. If you agree, say amen. 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 So we're getting straight into this thing. Colossians chapter four. We're gonna start in verse two and going through verse six. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well. That's what Paul says. Pray at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Verse five, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. That's non-Christians. That's people who are not Christians yet. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace. Some of your versions will say gracious, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So Paul is wrapping up this letter to the Colossians, a letter he penned from prison. So even while he himself was in chains, He is writing to encourage others in their faith. Be strong, young Christians. Keep the faith, young Christians. Don't let others deceive you. Don't let others look down on you. You have been made sons and daughters of God, and this is how you walk this thing out. I love it how Paul is encouraging other people from a position that we would normally think needs encouraging. Paul is a prisoner. Paul is under Roman guard because of his faith in Christ, yet... He doesn't use his circumstances as an excuse to be ineffective. He doesn't say, I guess it's all over now. I guess since I'm locked up, God has forgotten me. I guess I'll just wait and see if things get better before I try to do something with myself. Hmm. It's actually quite the opposite. Paul leverages his situation in being effective. Paul uses the season he finds himself in to make some of the most powerful and profound faith statements that we have. He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost 
all things. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Shall I go on? (laughs) I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances, Paul says. I can do through him who gives me strength anything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote every one of these as he sat in prison. Paul doesn't let his circumstances become an excuse. He lets them become the platform he preaches from. See, you can be in chains and the Lord still give you an opportunity. You can be in bondage, yet the Lord use you to reach people. You can be broken, discouraged, imperfect, desperate, and God can still use you to reach this world with his gospel. God has never chosen perfect people to do his work. Thank God. He takes the broken and makes them whole. He takes the sinner and makes them saints. He takes people right where they are at and he makes them instruments of his gospel. This is the good news of Christ. This is the gospel. And that same gospel that has saved you is for somebody else. (laughs) I wonder who is waiting on you to have hope. I wonder who is feeling the same rejection you felt that is just waiting on you to share the hope of Christ with them. Come on. Oh, you were waiting on things to get better? Hmm. You were waiting until you cleaned up your act a little bit before you told others about Jesus? Mm. No. Now is your time. Today is the day. This says to make the most of every opportunity. Listen to me. Your position is your platform. Your position is your platform. Wherever you find yourself right now, in a good place, if you're in a tough spot, if you're hurting or feeling victorious, wherever you find yourself born into or surrounded by, maybe it's privilege, maybe it's pain, addiction, subjugation, wherever you stand, right now is a position you can use to bring glory to God. See, as Christians, our purpose is actually pretty simple. It's to know God and to make Him known. To experience the love of God. And as we are growing to be fully devoted followers of Christ, we are using our lives to make more fully devoted followers of Christ. That means whatever the circumstances, my eyes are fixed on eternity. No matter the injustice I may suffer, the end I'm ultimately aiming for is more people knowing Jesus. More people becoming followers of this God that I know and serve. Paul, writing from a place of imprisonment, he says, pray for me. But not that he may be set free. He says, pray for me, but not that there would be justice. Paul says, pray for me so that, verse 3, I can tell you what it says. It says, God will open up a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. That's what he prays for. As he sits in chains, he says, this is why I want you to pray for me so that God would open up a door for us to tell about this Jesus that I know, about the one that saved me, about the one that pulled me out of my own crap, and now I got something to tell to somebody else. Even while he's locked up, Paul's mind is on Christ. His focus is on his purpose. I wonder, what are you focused on? Where is your mind today? Is it on your circumstances? Is it on what ails you? Is it on things that make you uncomfortable? Or is your mind on eternity? 
Is it on leveraging the platform you have to bring eternal change, not just temporary change, but leveraging this platform, the position you're in, to bring eternal change to somebody else's life? Because even when you are suffering injustice, even when you don't have everything as you hoped as it would be, you can help somebody else. Your position is your platform. In verse 5, Paul continues. He says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Some of your versions say making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with what? Filth. No. Mm. With proving you're right. No. Mm. <laughs> What's another good one I should say? Uh, let your speech always be filled with making your point. No. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt That's good. so that you will know how you should respond to each person. There needs to be a wisdom in the way we live our lives amongst those who are not yet followers of Christ. It makes no sense to needlessly antagonize them or make them feel like less to stir things up for no real reason other than to air our own opinion. We should live in a way that is attractive and gives outsiders, non-Christians, it gives them a favorable impression of the gospel. Then, as we have opportunity, we make the most of it. We share the gospel of Christ. We invite them to our small group. We offer to bring them to church and buy them lunch afterwards. We have to be ready to make the most of every opportunity presented to us because time is short. And you never know when that opportunity might be the last opportunity. See, eternity matters. And how we walk matters. And how we talk matters. Are you able to say that your speech is full of grace? That it's gracious, as if it were seasoned with salt? Is what you say to your co-workers winsome? Is how you talk to your kids kind? Will they grow up loving that God that you serve, or will they think that He's harsh? Is that post that you made attractive? If it's not, we need to change something. We need to submit ourselves to this new nature that we have been given in Christ because we have a choice. Come on, say, I have a choice. I have a choice. We have a choice to make every day. Do we serve our flesh or do we serve the Spirit? Come on. Do we press into and give into the desires of our sinful nature or do we press into this new nature that God has gifted to us? Are we going to use our position as a platform to push our own agenda or use it to promote the agenda of Christ? On. Which one do we choose? So Vent an opinion or share hope? <laughs> Stir up a fight or promote peace? Inflict more wounds or bind them up? The positions we have are our platforms and it is our privilege as followers of Christ to leverage whatever platforms we have and whatever circumstances we are walking through to be for the glory of God. Yes, sir. Don't underestimate your platform. Don't underestimate your influence. Don't be fooled into thinking nobody's watching you. Somebody's watching you all the time. Somebody's eyes are on you. Somebody's opinion of who God is and what Christians are like and what the church must be like are being formed by what you are doing and by what you are saying every moment of the day. Now, they may not tell you. You may not know it, but your words and your actions, especially towards non-Christians, are making an impact more than you know. And I realize that can feel heavy. I get it that that realization, it can feel like a large burden to carry. So I want to point you back to verse 2. Go back to this, the beginning of this passage that we read. 
how can we go about living this life in Christ? Because, you know, none of us are perfect. None of us has mastered this thing. But what can we actually do that will help us in our walk with Jesus? What can we do to help us in choosing the Spirit over the flesh? Let's go back and look at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So we devote ourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it in prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving. See, being thankful, man, it makes such a huge difference. Yes, sir. I, I can be thankful even in the middle of trying times. Mm. Did you know that? Yes, just, like, just like I can know peace when everything around me is spinning out of control. Just like I can know joy in the middle of grief. Yes, Our connection with God enables us to choose an attitude of thanksgiving, even when things are not perfect in our lives. Am I, am I thankful, for example, um, am I thankful for this worldwide pandemic? Am I thankful for this virus that's everywhere? No. <laughs> am I thankful for lives being lost? No. Am I thankful for all of the jobs lost and the pain that's being felt? No. But am I thankful for how this season has reframed our homes as hosts for the presence of God? That, that the church is more than a building? That it's reminded us our living rooms can be places that we actually meet with God? Yeah, I'm thankful for that. And see, the more I'm thankful, the less I'm resentful. The more I'm thankful, I don't know about you, but the more I'm content. The more I'm thankful, the more my heart is overflowing with praise. And I'm way less likely when I'm like that to be blowing up on somebody because I'm offended. I'm less likely to give them a piece of my mind because that's what they deserve to hear. I'm way less likely to react to hate with hate because instead of leaning into the power of my flesh, I'm leaning into the power of Christ who's right. in me and who would love those who are persecuting me. See, an attitude of thanksgiving makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's this attitude that we keep and we stay alert in while being devoted in prayer. Now, as Christians... We talk about prayer a lot. You know the value of prayer. <laughs> you know the power of prayer. You know that as your pastor, I'm going to talk about prayer. It's just what pastors do. And Paul here is talking about it. And Paul says here in verse 2, to devote yourselves to prayer. Mm. Devote yourselves. He says not just to pray, but to be devoted to it, to be strong in it, to be vigilant, to be persistent in it. And this too, I know, is a challenge for many of us. Now, maybe you're a prayer warrior and you like to just pray for fun for three or four hours on a Friday night. That ain't me. Like, <laughs> that ain't how I'm wired. That is not most of us. Being vigilant or, or being, uh, you know, as, as Paul would say, what's the word he used? Devoted. Devoted in prayer for many of us looks like we actually remember to pray before a meal, you know? Prayed over all three meals today. Success. You know, I've been persistent. But we're talking about something completely different here. Right. A devotion to prayer. An alertness in prayer while being thankful. So I want to help you in this and give you a challenge at the same time. Last week on our Facebook Live at 945, that's what happens before we air this message. So if you haven't joined us before, Facebook Live at 945 Blueprint Church Nashville. Join us. Last week on that live segment, we made some statements about what is going on in our country, specifically speaking to how racial equality is at the forefront of our collective minds right now. One of the most influential leaders our country has ever seen in the plight for racial equality was Martin Luther King Jr., and in perhaps his most iconic speech, the one he gave from the nation's capital in 1963, the one that is known as I Have a Dream, Dr. King said many things that are still remembered today, many things that are quoted, many things that are just as stirring as they were 57 years ago. Right. Now, one of the things in that speech he said 
in response to those who would ask the devotees of civil rights and the movement when they asked, when will you be satisfied? This is what he said. We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. This phrase is the most frequent phrase he ever used in all of his speeches and writings. It wasn't maybe the most famous, but the most frequent. Little do people know he was quoting Amos chapter 5, verse 24. A long time before Martin Luther King Jr. quoted these words, God spoke them through a prophet named Amos to a society that was enjoying great prosperity, great indulgences in luxury, even as there was rampant immorality, corruption in the justice system, and oppression of the poor. MLK quoted this verse more than any other, and maybe it's because he knew something. He knew that justice is essential. It is something that is necessary and cannot be denied. It is something that should happen and should not be delayed. But he also understood that justice is limited. Justice can only react to the problem. It does not cure it. It does not offer a solution. But righteousness, (laughs) righteousness speaks to the root of the problem. Righteousness speaks to a changing of heart that leads to a changing of action. See, to have justice without righteousness just means we repeat the problem. It means that we keep reacting to the ugly parts of ourselves without addressing the root issue. Mm. Yes, we need justice and we also need righteousness. Justice is for yesterday. Righteousness is for tomorrow. I don't know about you, but I want tomorrow to be free of these issues. I'm tired of these things happening. Yeah. I'm weary of violence. I'm worn out on hatred and discord and injustice. But until hearts change, yeah. until we see a fresh flow of righteousness in the hearts and the lives of men and women across this globe, people will continue to hate, to respond to situations incorrectly, and people will be victimized. So I want you to join me in being devoted to prayer. I want to challenge you. Anytime you witness injustice, anytime you see more pop up on the news, I want you to pray this verse. Every time your screen is flooded with the latest horrible images, every time your social feed is filled with hate, I want you to stop and stand with the truth of Scripture And pray the words of Amos 5, 24. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's my challenge to you. To pray this verse and hope that somehow and pray and believe that somehow God can bring justice and righteousness together. It's a simple challenge, but one that could have profound effects. Will you join me? Will you join me in petitioning God to change our hearts so that we can see answers for the past and the future? Would you join me in being devoted to pray this prayer? If you're in on this challenge, just simply type and say, I'm in. Just say, I'm in. I want to see that feed filling up with commitments right now to pray. Come on, let's take a spiritual action, a spiritual stand to see God move because it's going to take more than just good motives in our hearts, y'all. It's going to take just good intentions. It's going to take some change from the inside out. It doesn't mean you don't do anything physical. It doesn't mean you don't put feet to this, but we've got to start with what we know is the ultimate answer, and that is Jesus. Accept this challenge. I just want you to show your commitment. Just type, I'm in. Many people are joining us in this prayer. Many pastors that I'm in community with, churches that we are affiliated with are praying the same thing, that justice 
and righteousness would flow in our cities and in our country and in our world. Without righteousness, we go this same moment again and again. Without righteousness, we're going to replay these current ills in a different way. But where justice is the answer to the past, righteousness is the answer to the future. Let's believe for both. I believe God can do it. Let's pray. God, we come before you as one family under the identity of Christ where there is no longer slave or free, Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, black, white, any shade of brown, Lord, as one were yours. The way it's going to look in heaven, Lord, we come together right now as a family that's sons and daughters of God. And we petition you and we pray begging for justice and righteousness. What seems impossible to us of even how to go about it. Father, we pray for heavenly solutions. We pray that justice would flow, that wrongs would be addressed. And at the same time, Father, we pray that you would move in our hearts to administer that justice in a righteous way. Lord, that we would want to act righteously as you are righteous, being upstanding and true and not partial to one party or another, Lord, but being right and fair towards every person. Lord, help us to have changed hearts, and we know only you can do it. We're asking for it, God. Would you change our hearts to be more like you? We pray for our city. God, we pray for our state and our nation. God, we pray for this whole world. Would you move on hearts? Draw us into deeper relationship with you. Father, I pray for people who don't know you that they would know you because I know ultimately that hope for eternal life and also just hope for this life in the fullest way we can live it is only found in you. Draw us to you and change our hearts to be more like you. And Father, those of us who are walking with you but not walking as you, as you would, Lord, help us. Forgive us where we fall short. And Lord, we repent of those ways. We want to follow you now. Give us new hearts molded by you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So glad so many of you are jumping in on that challenge. I want to give one more invitation today. And that's to everybody who's watching this morning. If you've never given your life to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible talks about how all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. You may say, well, I can have these values without having your God. I think that's true to a certain extent. But I also know that what happens past this life only hinges on one thing. And it's if you know Jesus as your Savior. The Bible clearly says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God, you believe in his heart, in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. The only way we're righteous before God is by the perfect blood of Jesus that was shed on a cross for you. It was one Jesus who died on one cross for all of us. No matter the color, race, background, what you think that you've done is unforgivable, God's died, and God has sent His Son to die for you. I want to give you an opportunity right now to confess your sins and accept Him as your your personal Lord and Savior. It's as simple as asking Him into your heart today. Now, wherever you're at, I'm going to give you some words to pray. You can pray something similar and you can start that relationship with God today. Let's go to God in prayer. You can just say, Dear God, God, in Jesus' name, name, I come to you. I I know know that I'm a sinner sinner. and I don't want to act that way way. anymore. Anymore. I follow you. I I turn from those old ways. ways. Come into my life life. and be my Lord. I believe believe on the death, on the the burial, burial and the resurrection resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. Have every part of me. me. I love you. you. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. 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 Hey, if you just prayed that, 
That's the best decision you can ever make. That's the decision that leads to everything else being as God would have it to be in your life. I'm excited for you. I'm happy with you. If you would, just text that number on the screen. Text Jesus to that number, and it lets us know that you made a decision. Now we can follow up with you, get you more resources, know your name, know who you are, and connect with you in community so that you can take some next steps. Because this is just step number one. Next steps in your life so you can become who God has fully created you to be. Thank you guys so much this morning for being with us. I love you. Can't wait to see you again soon. Thank you all so much for watching with us today. Here at Blueprint Church, this is family. So community is always important to us. Doing life together is part of our design. And one of the best ways we can do that is through small groups. So go now to blueprintchurch.tv slash small groups to sign up for our summer small groups. Then make sure you follow Blueprint Church Nashville on all social media platforms to keep up with what's going on. We'll see you right back here next Sunday. You all have an awesome week.